The boys are at it again. We're on Cochran's Crossing. We're rolling up to uh, meet Team RR. My brother's a little under the weather, so today he'll probably just sit in, not do anything crazy. But uh, the boys announced that they might be going to the lake, so we're gonna sit in because that's a nice long ride with them. And we'll try to get a lot of clips. On this ride, Paul and I left Northampton. We rode into the woodlands, picked up Team RR, headed out on Research Forest, went down Fish Creek. The plan was to go to the lake. We did a couple of regrouping there, and then once we got out of 105, we cut through Highland Hollow, nice little 15% climb, headed out. Longmire Road all the way to 1097. We stopped filming on 8.30 and then we went across the bridge back into Montgomery where we stayed with the group because Paul wasn't feeling great, had a bit of a stomach ailment over the weekend. So we came back with the group. The pace was really good. It was a nice change to what we normally do, but we just wanted to reduce the number of hours since he had felt all the, the, the weather the day before. So when you don't feel great sometimes, tone it down, either drop the intensity or the duration. But I think you will love the clips that we put together for you. Yeah, we're giving Mike uh, Weingrad a hard time because he was the one they waited for two weeks ago. He showed up at 7.35 and they wanted to give him a standing ovation for showing up five minutes late. I'm like, please, stop lowering the bar. He's a grown man. He wants to ride with you. He needs to show up on time. It's really that simple. We quit coddling people and expect more. So Mark, Mark is giving the route, deciding whether they want to stop at the boathouse or taco corner. So nobody wanted to stop at the boathouse. Let's go. Got some new shoes on my machine. A Continental 5000 uh, tires. I got them from uh, Paulie Longa. They look good on the bike. I like the pat that color, that pat that color. It suits mm -hmm. the bike. That's Christian on the left. He lives close to where we are. At least he's a little further in, in so he's asking me when we leave from my house. I thought I would leave at 6.40. He, he leaves around 6.15. He's got to navigate a few more kilometers. That's what we're talking about. Um, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but uh, when you get on these group rides, there's always somebody who wants to pry. You see them occasionally, and they want to ask you personal questions about your life and this and that. Mike Weingrab, Mr. Late, <laughs> likes to do that. So I asked him this weekend on this ride, it was off camera. I said, are you writing a book? It's kind of rude to be asking people personal questions that you're not close to. You know, say hello and be quiet. If somebody wants to give you information, they will give it to you. But if you're not involved in the person's life in depth, you know, there are just certain things you don't need to know. I don't need to know how much money you make every month. I'm not the one spending it. I don't need to know how you make your money. It doesn't concern me either. They ask all these questions that people close to you would just know because they're around you and they're involved in your life. So if you're not involved in the person's life, stop crying. It's rude. So I don't, I don't cotton to that, as they say down here. I shut them up quickly. I tell them I'm a private person. And I don't see why you need to know that. 
There's a certain things that are off limits. If you're not close to the person, quit prying. Mind your business. Say hello, good morning, nice day, nice weather, and get to the business of writing. You don't meet somebody and then ask them what's your birthday or what's your age. That's rude. That's none of your business. <laughs> we ain't that tight because if we were, you wouldn't be asking that. I hope you get my drift. It's rude. It's a nice warm morning. It's 21 Celsius, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a warm, it feels like 70, thereabouts. So what Christian and I are discussing is that uh, he, he put something in GPS to get him to this ride because he's not as familiar with all these streets. And he said that it took him on a busier road and he didn't really want to navigate a busier road later in the day. So he was asking me how Paul and I get back to the street that I call North Crest in Northampton. And that's what we're talking about. And those are the kind of conversations I like to talk about. It's practical. This guy wants to know how to get to the ride and how to get from the ride. That's a tangible conversation. That's a real conversation. Instead of those phony conversations about stuff that means nothing to anyone. So that's what he's talking about. You know, Christian leaves home at 6.15 in the morning. Why in the heck should he wait for somebody at 7.30? <laughs> you know, he, he rode for an hour just to get here. And someone else who lives 10 minutes away can't get there on time. He ain't serious. Well, I just want to see how it's going to feel at the end of... Uh, yeah, Paul and Greg are talking about the fact that Paul was uh, a little under the weather. He had a stomach ailment the day before, and so he wanted to see how he would feel. So once he told me about it, um, and then we hooked up with these guys, and since they were doing the longer route, when we got out there and we got to the stop, he told me, yeah, I'm feeling a little weak, so I told him, let's just head back in with them. So we sat in on the bunch coming back home and just came back with them. We did not do our usual seven hours. I thought, oh yeah, let's just shorten the ride, let's get back. And you know, the, the weather's getting warmer anyway, so we're gonna increase our intensity in, in about five or six hours of a ride. That's gonna be our goal. We wanna get back around noon or a little after, no later than 1 p.m. Because that's when it really starts to get hot, starting next month in June. So our summer starts like, June 22nd officially. So Christian on the right is an all-around strong rider. He rides with uh, more of them. He used to ride with us a while back. We'd ride together. But right now he's getting ready for the Milano San Remo. And so on this ride he was going to go longer. Milano San Remo is in June in, in, uh, in Europe and he's going to go do that ride. Christian is from Italy. So he told me he's getting ready for that. He was wondering if we were going to go longer. I told him at this point in the ride, yeah, we're going to do our usual stuff. But once we got out there, riding with them, the pace was fast. So by the time we got to the first stop, we just made the decision to come back in. Because Paul was not feeling 100%, even though he rode well. The cadence is going to vary. I put the arrow on my leg so you can kind of watch. I was spinning a little while ago, triple digits. Now I'm doing like 79, 80. You need to be able to do all of that. When you're going up a, a sustained climb and people are forcing the pace, you don't want to fan a small gear too long. It can affect your, your breathing. That's Doug Shot greeting him. That's Kenny on the right there. I hadn't seen Doug in a long time. His brother Greg is the one who was, but was teasing me last week, saying that I was serious. 
they both live in the woodlands area so we're just shooting the breeze with chatting ours is a cool sport we're moving at 30 kilometers an hour that's 18 or 19 miles an hour and we're just talking and that is just cool i got the suki jersey on i tell you what they've been a very good sponsor look in the description of this video go to suki sports S-O-U-K-E-Sports.com Their jerseys are good quality and well priced. Use Velo Harmony as a code and you will get an additional 15% discount off their great prices. So Suki has turned out they're gonna be sending more colorways. You know, now that summer's coming, they're always coming up with different designs and so forth. One they've got called a smiling shark. We're supposed to get that in green. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, tell Doug about the Velomobile that I mentioned in the last video. The Velomobile, yeah, Doug said they're fast. Their Achilles heels when you go up. But on a flat road, they really move. I don't know. You load to the ground, you're all covered up. It's very aero. Is Maurizio not riding today? Oh, okay. Yeah, the MS-150 happens to be today. I don't follow that ride. I think it's just gotten out of hand as far as the pricing. It's for a good cost, but it's just, it excludes too many people. The start is like 400 bucks. And then if you can get more donations, you know, they let you do their fundraising for them. I've done it in the past. Been there, done that. Have no interest in it. Furthermore, there's too many inexperienced cyclists on the ride. So you've got say eight to ten thousand people riding and every second on your left on your left some of them don't even look they just change lines so these are just very very uh inexperienced cyclists that are not that well versed in bike safety handling and so forth so you just increase your chances of a mishap it requires an excessive amount of attention when you do the ms-150 and the riders are varying skills in there, so if you latch on with a fast group, even then, you all got to be calling out to people who just don't pay attention to the other cyclists that are doing the same ride. And I always wonder, where do they ride to where you don't look before you move over? It's kind of like driving your car. You don't change lanes without checking. You'd think they would have that, and that nuance down. But you'd be amazed what you see in that, in that particular ride. The levels of skill is all over the map. This is 1488. <laughs> So Mark just asked me if my daughter was ready to graduate. That's how much out of touch he is. My daughter's already graduated. <laughs> That's what I was talking about. You know, you're you're not involved enough. You have not kept up. Just let it go. Because you don't need to know. You know, <laughs> he said, is your daughter getting ready to graduate? I said, my daughter's already graduated. <laughs> Whatever else you want to know about my daughter, you can talk to her yourself. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Sometimes it's best to just say good morning and let it go. His response, I couldn't hear. So I here. Yeah. Yeah. So Maurizio is doing the the, the MS-150. I'm telling Paul that Christian wanted to go along with us. At this point, we we're we're, we're planning on just doing our regular ride. That's what I'm talking about. And so always feel free to modify your ride. You go out there, you feel great. Extend it if you have the time. <laughs> or if the weather gets more challenging and you don't feel up to it, shorten it. Yeah, yeah. The whole idea is to enjoy cycling. It's not a chore. It should not be. Yeah. 
And then based on what you're doing for your, for the day, you need to watch how you put out your effort. You know, not everybody does the entire ride. Some people will, go, will start with you and then out of drop off or turn or whatever. Everybody's doing different things. So if you're going long, modify your efforts, sit in more. If they're going too fast, let them go so you can accomplish the goal that you set for your day. Don't get drawn into doing something you didn't plan to do. We're talking about these drivers that turn. A lot of these neighborhood streets don't have an, a striping, but even on roads that are striped, they'll turn into the other lane instead of staying in their lane. They don't slow down enough. And they do that even when you're in a car in my neighborhood. You come around a curve and somebody is on your side of the road. And I'm like, really? Did somebody get up this morning and tell you that no one else on the planet will be using the roads? Just careless driving. And they create hazards that are not necessary. I'll go ahead and stay back while Mark is doing his hands free over here because it's a little breezy for that. When you're in the group and somebody's doing something that's not stable or steady, keep your distance. <laughs> and so I watched the show. She did have a mishap. Don't be part of the show. Don't do hands-free when it's very windy unless the wind is behind you, pushing you along, or directly in front of you. When it's blustery or coming from the sides, keep your hands on the bars. Then he just drops his water bottle. Paul moved left, I moved right. We split. <laughs> Mark. We just started the ride and it's like, we gotta wait. I'm gonna ride up and let these guys know that he dropped the water bottle because they can tell because not many of us came around the corner there. So I told Abby that Mark dropped his water bottle. Now let these guys know. So as far as water bottles and stuff like that, avoid trying to roll of the, over them. If somebody drops a water bottle, and you, you definitely want to try to avoid it, you know, because you can slip on it. And yeah, it can cause a crash. So I'm checking the mirror with soft pedaling here. I'm checking the mirror to see when everybody gets back together. On the way back, I threw away one of my, my water bottles that you see on there. One of them I had used a lot of electrolytes last season. And after a while, that plastic, it just, it gets to where you get this, it, this supposed to be supposedly BPA free or whatever. But the water or whatever you put in there starts getting a funny taste. Once it gets to that point, I figure I've gotten my money's worth out of it. They are plastic after all. Uh, in fact, this season I'm going to be using my aluminum clean canteen water bottles because they're insulated even though they're not as big as these. But man, they sure keep your drinks cool for hours. I'm talking in excess of five hours. They're a little heavier than the plastic bottles, but I'll take the weight for what they do. So I've got a couple of those that are insulated and what you know they, they work really well and you don't have to worry about any funny taste over time with the aluminum we're all back together and so the guys pick up the pace i go ahead and just rev up the gear i'm in i'm probably fanning a 53 19. yeah because i'm over 100 miles 100 kilometers an hour we're about 38k So what made me early on in cycling focus on bike fit was the fact that spinning with an uncomfortable saddle causes chafing. So you don't look forward to it. It's, it doesn't feel right. 
And I've always been into making sure, like, when I played soccer, that my shoes felt right, or when I played basketball, you know, all of that. So ergonomic, ergonomics has always been important to me. And that's how I got into it and got the proper training. And I'm so glad I did because uh, I see so many people shaking their hands on these rides, on clipping, hanging their feet out. I'm sure you guys have seen them on the film. All of that is because of an improper fit or an improper fitting accessory or your shoe or something. You should not be uncomfortable. If you do a long ride or a long run, if you're a runner, your shoes should not cause your feet to get dumb. That means you didn't really get the shoe fitted correctly. Fit is something all serious athletes continually pay attention to, because that's important. You, know, you don't want to run do a marathon as a runner and have blisters all over your feet. That means the shoe you picked wasn't right. And you shouldn't run with shoes you have not tested in training. Same thing with the bike. I'm going to bring out the other bikes that I have from time to time, but I really love this the feel of this steel, the blue steel bike here. I uh, have the uh, called Nago with a steel fork, those of you who've been following the channel. I have uh, been making some modifications to the, the pieces, like the seat post, the stem. I got to polish the uh, triple T stem, remove the anodize and then polish it, now it looks right. And so I'm getting some uh, sew ups for it. Because it's nice to just bring out these toys. If you're going to have two or three bikes every now and then, switch around. And then they all need to be set up the same way, otherwise you will prefer one over the other. You know, there's always one bike that fits better, but I was able to get all three of my bikes to fit the same. It doesn't mean they feel the same because the materials are different and depending on the wheels and the tires you put on there, yeah. So I really like these tires. I want to thank my brother, Paul Ilonga, for giving them to me. Uh, he got them and didn't like the way they looked on his bike and they work on this bike really well. So. Uh, he told me, hey, I've noticed you had the Rene Hurst on there. And so, yeah, I still have the Rene Hurst on another pair of wheels. I'm going to be switching them out. But these work really well. They look good on the bike. Just sitting in here, you know, and these guys are riding pretty fast. And we're doing 46 kilometers an hour. That's in excess of 28 miles an hour. You know, I mean, it's like... What's the hurry? <laughs> so you see why for the last several years, Paul and I, not, not just for this reason, Paul and I ride in excess of five plus hours every Saturday when, when we ride so that we can tolerate this kind of stuff. So, you know, right here, you can see my heart rate is at the top of Zoom 2 now. And, we, and we've been doing 25 plus miles an hour consistently combination of the draft and my fitness and everything and the way my bike fits me so I'm efficient that's very important that's Jerry and that's Doug Doug's taking a drink Doug has a triple T gravel bike well you know you can use it on the road and everything it has more clearance Jerry rides a lot. Last week, Jerry's on our Strava club <laughs> and he did over 500 some kilometers. I was like, man, this guy, where does he find the time? He puts in a lot of Ks. That's good. I like to see that. And you will see Jerry display that fitness because what will happen is uh, he will ride up when the group splits at a traffic light several times. And then one on, another time he will ride up when uh, Mark misses the well he, let, he lets the group go on the overpass because you will see that somebody just hammers the overpass like we're racing you know and you can see my heart rate is going down the more we ride <laughs> you know and that's really what ends up happening if you're if you're drafting properly and you're fit your heart rate should not continue to spike because the effort is not always at a peak there are peaks and valleys you know, you accelerate on a hump, then you settle down, you soft pedal, whatever. So it's up and down. I'm unzipping a little bit. It's just warm. You know, it's always the case the first month after the warm weather gets to our area. 
But we're moving around, you know, 25. I mean, this groove has gotten fast. So I, I really uh, think that it matters, you know, how often you ride is important so that the body gets used to it. Plus it becomes a lifestyle. It shouldn't be a once in a while thing. You should incorporate it into your life. When you get up in the morning, yeah, I ride my bike for 30 minutes, even if it's on the trainer. And then I go to the office for meetings or whatever. You know, I'm using that as an example. You just kind of come up with a routine. This is where the group will split. Because there are guys that were probably gapped before we got to the light. We'll check to see if everybody's together. But Paul says take it easy because he knows they are riders off the pace. This is what Jerry rides to the front to let them know that the group has a split. So we're going to soft pedal. I think we end up stopping. This happens frequently. So when you're riding with a group, don't take chances. If you're riding with a group that's on an open ride, this is more of a friendlier ride. Most of the people know each other. On an open ride, they may not wait for you. Don't risk it. Don't take chances. Stop for the light if you didn't get there on time. And then ride with whatever group is back there with you. And you guys will meet at the pre-arranged stop. But don't be running red lights just to keep up with the group. That's not worth it. So we're together. Paul's rolling. My S5 is up there in the distance. Yeah, there he is on the right. Pulled in a parking lot. That's all, you know, a few moments and the, the lights are not that long. They favor this road anyway. So if you're riding with a group that's pouring it on and the pace is tolerable, stay close, stay near the front because you guys will go through like a train. Don't let gaps open. That's always the case. So in a little bit, we're going to have to pour it on to get up to those guys. You see the watts going up. This road goes up. You can basically see it. If you look on the left, it says 2%. And when you're not fit, these are the efforts that get to you. And so when you do these efforts, you have to pay attention to how you feel in your group. And that will let you know, okay, yeah, I got more. Don't, when you're at your limit, let them go. You don't want to be peddling squares. Because sometimes, especially the repeat efforts up multiple climbs, or that's why on flat roads, riders will continually accelerate like in a criteria. It's those accelerations where you're doing 400 plus watts. And if you have not trained to hit those kind of efforts, your legs tell you, okay, I've had enough. So it takes years of training to ride at the, at the top levels. The same thing in any kind of sport. To play at the top levels, you have to invest the time. But it really needs to be an incorporation of whatever you love to do, whatever sport it is, into your lifestyle. It's just something you do. You know, you do it daily, it just becomes a part of your life and then it's automatic. Because I look forward to getting on my bike. It's fun. Doesn't need to be long. Even if it's just one hour, you get out and spin. The road goes up here. And you see the watch will go up a little bit. I'm surprised it didn't go up more than that. That's good. When you stand, you use more watts, of course. I think more than 50% more because when, when I stand, the, the watts go up dramatically. You are using more muscles.
got a nice tight line going here and the whole time I'm paying attention to not just the guy in front of me I'm also watching the people in front of him and I'm also periodically glancing in my mirror at the riders following me you want to always be attentive so you know what's going on you can see 400 and some watts now it's dropping a little bit the road goes up we don't back off that much we keep going so when you're riding even by yourself and the road goes up use that as an opportunity to do an interval like a work interval The gap between Mark and the rider following him is too big. I'll get a little closer. I think that's road kill here. There's an armadillo, our Texas speed bump. Those things you don't want to roll over them, the hard shell. Plus you don't want that smell all on your tires. Eh? The armadillos only come out at night, they're nocturnal, and they're hard to see. They're brown and low to the ground, so they get run over quite often. My guess 5 pulls off the front. We're doing almost 30 miles an hour here. It's a slight downhill. I'm really just coasting, and then in a little bit, the road's going to go up. And this is where you have to watch your gearing. You want to keep your rhythm consistent. It starts to go up. We're coming to the overpass. We're not there yet. I think this is like, yeah, 2%. So it's a 2% bump. Then it's gonna level off before we get to the overpass. But it's a nice little grade as you approach. And so you have to think in terms of, in my mind, making it all one climb. From there all the way over the overpass. And you prepare for anything. Because contrary to popular opinion, people always say, oh, this is gonna be an easy ride. You guys know, and then you get out there and it's harder than a race. <laughs> so don't fall for that. You want to ride easy, ride by yourself or with your close friend. <laughs> you know. You can see 500 and some watts. Somebody's twisting the screw at the front. I think it's Mike Barrera up there. So we're putting the power down. We're doing 25 miles an hour on a 3% climb. Now it's leveled off. In a few hundred meters, Jerry is going to come and let us know that we've lost, I think, Mark and probably a couple of other people. I, think my, I don't think it was only Mark. It might be, I don't know. But I think he says, yeah, Mark's off the back and he's trying to keep the group together. That's Darren. Darren's gonna let him know to slow it down. So Doug's gonna go ahead and take the lead here. I'm just gonna sit on his wheel. I don't wanna exert any extra effort. It's a lot easier to just sit on that wheel than try to ride up to him in a little bit. And Jerry's gonna come up in a little bit and let us know Mark is not here. We lost him on the overpass. I think that's what he's gonna let us know. That's kind of a hiatus, but we're moving at about 22, 23 miles an hour. About 22 miles an hour. So 
for him to catch up, they have to do 23 or 25. That's going to catch us quickly. So. So what Mike Barrera just said is keep the pace low and he'll get here, but not at 22 miles an hour. We need to drop it to like 20 <laughs> or 18. Say that so Jerry rides up to let Doug know. And this is really how you can wait for people, really. You, you back off, let them catch back up. But then the thing is after that is you have to keep the pace even. In other words, take longer poles instead of just killing it at the front and then you end up waiting so Doug had wanted to pull off and stop I thought nah just drop it down just drop it down we're, we're coasting here that's why the speeds are going up and Doug and I are just chatting at the front so that's what happens when you don't train consistently. So the weather now, we're in the spring, the weather's nice and everything. Uh, everybody who has been doing the work is fit and you're struggling. You've got to train consistently, you know. <laughs> they make clothes for winter for a purpose. You're not supposed to hibernate like a bear in the winter. You need to get out there. <laughs> it's always going to be hot, cold, warm, whatever. You adapt and overcome. <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've dropped it. We're about 18 miles an hour now. And Jerry comes and says, okay, he's here. Let's go. And so I tell Doug, well, hold the same pace so that Mark can recover because he had to ride up to us. So I'm going to get on Doug's wheel. Now, this guy in the middle here didn't get the memo, I guess. In a little bit, he's going to ride off the front. Doug and I will just ignore him. This is why I'm talking about cycling with attention. You have to understand what is going on. You're going to play a sport, learn the rules. There's a lot of guys that ride a lot. They have no idea what cycling tactics are or why they do what they do. I'm sure you see that. You know, a lot of times we'll talk about Abby just pulling up to the, to the left of the rider in the front and sitting in the wind. I was like, what is that about? So you need to educate yourself about the nuances of whatever sport. You're going to play soccer, learn the nuances, learn the rules. You're going to ride a bike, learn why pe what people are doing when they go to the front. How are they going to pull or they're attacking or whatever. But why attack when we spent the last several minutes waiting for people to get back? So as soon as they get back, then you attack. How does that keep them in the group? Now watch it. So Doug looks at him like, uh, yeah, whatever. And we just ignore him like he's not there. It's as if to say he were not here when we're waiting for Mark. And that's what I'm talking about. So people in the know would just chuckle. You know, it's like, there goes Mr. Clueless. <laughs> we spend five minutes or more waiting on somebody and now you're attacking. Okay, yeah, right. And I will show you another thing that he does. He'll, we'll be riding and he'll just sit in the wind until the wind starts pounding him. Then he's looking for a way in. I never let him in in front of me. Get your butt to the back. You want to chat, you will fight the wind. We're riding and you want to sit in the wind? Yeah, well, maybe you'd like to work. Do the work. And then once it starts getting hard, then he starts looking for shelter. <laughs> so those are the things you need to watch out for. Understand why things are done so they make sense. You're feeling good. We just waited for somebody. Get to the front. Stay there longer. What are you attacking for? So we can drop them again and then wait again. We'll spend the whole ride waiting. And he went nowhere. Just wasted all that effort. I just keep riding. Just, you know, we're, we're going. There's no reason for us to slow down here. We're just, we're already going pretty slow. We're doing 17 miles an hour. So I go ahead and turn. We're headed east. 
In a little bit, I'm going to ask Darren. Darren comes behind me. I'm going to ask him if we're all together. Because usually on the turns, not everybody turns as aggressively. The slight gaps. I'm going to soft pedal. Then I ask Darren, and then he'll say, yeah, we're rolling or something like that. It's hard to hear in the wind. I'm looking back to make sure everybody's there. If you see me at the front, I'm feeling good. And on this ride, I had good legs. So I'm looking in my mirror, then I ask him, and he says, yeah, we can roll. Something like that. So I just go ahead, then I start pulling. But I'm going to pull, like, at a moderate effort. Because I know what it took for Mark to get back. He still needs to catch his breath. Now, there's, there's the guy on the right there going into the wind again to chat. And what's going to happen is that wind's going to start pounding him. Because everybody else is in the line. He does that often. I'm not sure what that is about. But you will find a lot of people that ride. Just because somebody rides a lot does not mean they understand the sport. Not everybody are students of the sport. You're on this channel because you're a student of the sport. You're seeking information. You want to be educated. Not everybody is, is, is doing that. A lot of riders that ride a lot don't even know how to change a flat tire. I don't know how they get by. It takes them forever to do simple stuff. Some of them don't even know how the skewers work. You see a lot of riders will open the skewer, then turn the nut on the other side. Why? It's already set for your frame. You know, I just watch them and like wonder, okay. I just, my personality, I want to know. Whatever it is I'm into, I want to understand it. And, you know, that's the person, that's what it takes. So he's just sitting on the right there, and the wind is pounding from that side. But he's not even talking to anybody, so I don't know why he's there. But this road here, 105, if you, you look at it, you can see it's going up here. It has a lot of undulations, and you pay the price. And we ride this road a lot, so I'm keeping it right at the top of Zoom 2. I'm not looking at heart rate when I ride. I'm, I can just tell by the effort. We're keeping it steady because we've got that 15% climb in that neighborhood coming up. So as the road levels off, I shift up. You will see the speeds are going up already. We're doing about 24, let's see, 23, 24 miles an hour. About 23. My heart rate is going up because I'm punching a hole in the wind. And so I figure if I'm at the top of tempo, that's a good pace. And we get in there steadily. I'm off the front. I'm done. I'm going to slide in here. Paul leaves a gap for me. Paul leaves a gap because I need to be in the clips. Because the way these cameras film, they make short clips. And if I can't find where I am to synchronize the geophysical location, our data is inaccurate. Because I'm using my head unit. You see where I am, I'm getting, I'm, I'm finding the drive right there. The wind will shift because this road is not perfectly straight. Now you see me, I will drift to the left or directly behind Christian. I am getting the draft. Now I want, I hope we get a good shot at it. At this point, he's working on there. I don't know why, why he's there. <laughs> there are no medals. You see him going backwards? It's getting harder. You don't get medals for that. Unless you're just so much faster than the group and you want to work harder, then if, if that's the case, go to the front and tow the group. Why waste your effort on the side? You're not helping the group there. Those are the things I talk about. I was like, I see that and I just shake my head. Like, what, what, you know. Don't sit in the wind. Go take a pull. Help your group along. The, the guy at the bike barn, uh, what is it, Kurt, that used to be at the bike barn before Trek bought them. He said, uh, if you're feeling good enough, you need to help the group you're with. Because if everybody gets up there, even if it's for 30 seconds and take their cuts, you're all better off. Not only do you learn how to handle the movement through the group, the group keeps moving along. 
There's a lot of debris and stuff. That's why I'm staying a little to the right just to keep my eyes on it. And I keep my cadence above 90 where possible just to make sure I can accelerate smoothly. So anywhere from 85 and up or 80 and up. Whatever gear that will let me stay in that range. 80 to like 120. I just sit in that gear when I'm in the group. So I don't have to shift much, just rev. On these roads, you do have to shift because they're changing. If you look at the road in the distance, it goes to the left and it's dipping down. So, so we're going to be shifting to harder gears to keep the rhythm similar. All of those little things are important. So the reason I'm watching all the riders, not just Christian in front of me, is when they back off, I soft pedal. There he is again. <laughs> I close the gap. I don't want him in front of me. You want to sit out there? Sit out there. <laughs> Go ahead and bite the wind. <laughs> There's a reason we're all here. You see, he's out of the picture. He's struggling. It's like, why are you sitting there? You want to be at the front? Go take a pull. So yeah, it's important. Look out for that. Know what you're doing. And if you don't know, look it up. How do you ride in a pace line? Look that up. There's a lot of videos and articles and stuff out there. So that what you're doing will make sense to your mates that you ride with. Even if you're not close to them. They'll, they'll be like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. Or this person knows. You know, it's like... Educate yourself. Whatever it is you're going to do. You get a new job, educate yourself about how that company works and what's going on with your job don't just know one thing understand the whole ball of wax you'll be more valuable and then you will gain experience that you can use where you are or take with you when you leave because that's what it is you don't stay in school forever every job is an education you put that on your resume because you're saying hey i worked here this is what i learned that's what a resume is so educate yourself I cycle for 10 years. This is what I know. <laughs> don't cycle for 10 years and learn nothing. <laughs> You're just fast, but you don't know the timing of when to use. Cycling is all about timing. Life is all about timing. Everything you do, it matters when you do it. You playing basketball, you jump for a rebound before the guy shoots. <laughs> you look like a fool. <laughs> So learn it, know the rules, and apply it. it. It just works better. You got all that effort that you waste here when somebody goes harder later and you have not recovered, you pay the price. I'm sitting on that white line. There's a lot of crap here. Look, the old tires from cars and then pieces of wood. I did not want to shift, so I just stood and rolled that gear. See all these guys sitting in, Mr. Man, somewhere back there now. He's hiding behind. I don't know what he's doing. It's like there's a reason those guys are sitting in. They're going, we found out later, they're going to be doing a long ride. That's Doug and that's Kenny back there in the light green. They're going to be doing a longer ride. We're all going to go until we got to the store and, you know, Paul wasn't feeling like himself. And I thought I'd say, man, you rode well for somebody who's under the weather. So, yeah, we decided to just come back in. But otherwise, we would have gone with them. Because they're going long, they're riding smart. Not that they don't ride smart when they're going short, but they'll go harder. So there's no point in going very hard here when you know you're going to be spending a lot more hours out I'm going to ride up to Christian and let him know where we're turning. There's a red light up. I just tapped and I pointed because we have a lot of wind. We're riding into the east wind here. So I pointed so he'd know. So we're checking for traffic. We're looking for a gap, but we're not looking for a gap just for us. We're looking for a gap for the whole group. Because we're going across three lanes. And if you don't find a gap, 
Does London Raw will stopping and waiting till there's a gap or will go to that intersection and try to go across at 90 degrees? You don't need to take chances. We're riding our bikes. We're where we need to be. We want to be. We're not late for anything. We're already here. <laughs> so I'm letting Christian know he's never been in there. And letting him know that there are steep climbs in there because he likes climbing. He's a strong guy. So that's what we're talking about. Tell him that it's going to start out 5%, then at the corner it's going to go up to 15 so that he can be in the right gear. So by giving him that information, as soon as we turn, he puts it in a small chain ring. He's never been through this corner here. We don't come here that often, and he hadn't been out here, you know. So, but now he knows what to expect. They say he's going to be riding Milano San Remo. The Poggio is out there. <laughs> so now, uh, this is there are a lot of climbs in here, and all I do is I find a gear that I'm just going to spin. The, the road kicked up, so I stood for a little bit, but I'm not using heavy gears. You see the watts are up for something. So we're putting down a lot of watts. So what you want to do is, we're going to be climbing for about, let's say, maybe a kilometer or so, I'm guessing. You see my cadence, almost 100 RPM. I'm only doing that here. Once we get to the steepest parts, I'm going to use more power and push. Because that's what feels good for my body type. If you like to just twiddle a little gear, that's fine. But sometimes you got to push. I remember one time more told Paul, yeah, sometimes you got to push. He was helping him. He was pushing him on a rise. See? Sometimes you got to push. You can see now, as we turn, we start to gap the guy on the left who was sitting in the wind. You got to save your energy. And we're not going that hard, really. So I, those guys didn't know the turns. So I had to tell them to turn left at the top. This is almost what? What does it say? 15%? Yeah, 15%. Right here in the middle, on, the guy on the on the right there, he, he's paying the price for those efforts in the wind. You can see his pedaling was very slow. The fortunate thing is he's lucky we're not really an aggressive group that's attacking, because right there he would have been in trouble. We slowed down, we're waiting for those guys because they went straight and they, they made a U-turn to coming back, Christian and uh, Mike Barrera. So don't waste your energy unnecessarily. Save it, because you never know in a group ride when you'll need it. So even if you go to the front, don't pull too long. Take a cut. If you're feeling great, fine. Take a pull or save something, because you never know. The body goes through, changes throughout the ride. You can feel great one moment, and the next moment, you feel like, man, I might let all the air out. So yeah, Christian and Mike went straight. They should have turned so they're, they're back. I know what's to come, so I just rode that climb. Paul and I, we, we come here a lot. We like those climbs, so we know how they how they are. If you notice, Paul just stayed behind with the camera, and he didn't do any any monstrous effort. He just rode, just keeping things kind of even because he wasn't sure how his body would feel. When you have like a stomach uh, a bug, you can't keep anything down. I mean, you know, you get dehydrated. So, you know. so at the store, he got a lot of electrolytes. I let them know car up so people don't drift over that middle crack. There's a a dip right there. So, so the, the, the nature of this ride, this is actually a very subdued ride. This is not a very aggressive ride. In an aggressive group ride, after that climb, there wouldn't be this. People would still be accelerating and keeping the effort high. So right here, you get a chance to take a break. I don't know what the guy in the orange jersey was doing, but it, it, he kept doing that throughout the ride. He'd take his arm and put it behind him like he was stretching or whatever. 
If you if you going through that on your bike, go get a fit done by a reputable bike fitter. You shouldn't be uncomfortable. When I stand, my bike just comes for a walk. I don't wonder where it is. The hoods are right where my hands want them to be. And it's like I'm taking the bike for a walk. It's just there. That's the way your bike should be. You should be shifting around. So when the bike doesn't fit you, people don't like to stand because they find a spot that's comfortable. They want to sit there forever. <laughs> when your bike fits you, every time you sit, you're in the right spot. You don't have to wonder about it. So Jerry went to do a KOM. He's not in the group right here. When we turned left off of that highway, he went straight. I just told Paul that. Paul said he saw. I told him, I said, Jerry went straight. We found out later he was going after a Strava KOM. Uh, I don't do those things. They happen along the route. That's fine. But I don't seek them out. I don't spend any time on Strava. I load this ride on Strava. That's it. It loads automatically, actually, through Garmin Connect, just for the people that follow the channel. I already have my data. The logic of giving somebody data, then paying them to go look at it, that does not work with my right brain. It's my data. You should be paying me. <laughs> you know, I'm the one putting it there. Oh, but they claim, oh, yeah, you got analysis tools and all of that. So, yeah, it's a good business you know, for those who need that. But I have my own software that I do my analysis with, so. Never needed them before. And Strava is relatively new compared to how long this sport has been around, so I'm not sure how people were analyzing their data before Strava, because I already had an analysis software. The road is going to kick up in a little bit. You always gotta be aware. If you're on a new course, look around your, your, your mates. Look to see what's coming. There's no point in expending all your energy before you get to the base of a climb and then off the back on the climb. So you need to know when they're coming. Right here, you can see the road going up, the watts are going up. So when you train, you have to train in a manner that says, okay, if I'm riding with XYZ group, they're going to do about, say, 20 reps, you know, of high effort. So that means when you train, you need to do at least that. <laughs> you know, it's the reps that get you. This is Longmire Road. It has this, a few dips, but since they paved it with concrete and gave us two lanes, it's been really, really nice. Look at that sky. B E A beautiful. It's just great for the mind and the body 
to be outside. Human beings were not meant to be cooped up. That's unnatural. I'm letting them know we're going straight. I think Christian is up there. He doesn't come out here very frequently. And even if you do, there are two ways to get to Highway 830 where we're headed. At this intersection, you can turn right and go down maybe a kilometer and a half and then turn left. So about a mile to the right and turn left. Well, we're gonna go straight as a quieter road and turn right which is parallel to what you would do. It's a four-way stop sign. Christian checks, nothing's coming. We'll roll through as a unit. I'm gonna stand, I think, because I want to stay up. There's a little bit of a bump here. Yeah, 3%. As you go through, I want to stay close to the wheels. In an aggressive group, this is what you must do. You, you can't let the gaps open, then you work harder. So do the short efforts to stay on the wheel, and then you turn off the power. You can see the watts are low, because I'm on the wheels now. But if you were still back there chasing, you'd be doing four, five, six hundred watts, while we're doing 150. That's why you can't be sitting way at the back all the time. I tell them though we're gonna be turning right. You can't go straight, but it leads to nowhere. It's a dead end. Everything around here butts into Lake Conroe. The lake surrounds most of the land out here. That's Kenny here. Kenny is recovering from a, a crash where he had in a gravel race. He's got scars and a road rash to prove. We joked about it at the stop. He said he wasn't feeling 100%. I said, yeah, after you fall hard, you know, you gotta give your body a chance. You gotta use that energy to heal. He can't take the energy for healing to go ride a bike. <laughs> so you gotta ease back. You gotta do some easy rides. And let your body heal. Riding is good because you get that circulation. It helps. It promotes healing. But don't be trying to do zone five. I go to the right because you can see left easier. I see that it's clear. We'll let them know it's clear. And then right, all clear. This road goes up. And I knew Christian was going to push, so I just stayed close. 4%. So he's doing about 20 miles an hour at 4%, and then he's backing off a little bit. But it continues for about 3 kilometers, about 2 miles. So 830, up and down, and you're working. So if you had not saved the energy in that neighborhood or whatever, this is where people have problems. Because this road may not be the steepest, but if you've emptied the tank earlier, you pay the price here. So always remember that. Know how far you're going and always keep something in the tank. That's what I mean when I say cycling with attention. You must pay attention to how you feel, pay attention to what the other riders are doing around you, pay attention to what the other road users are doing, and be aware. It's not the time to put music in your ears and listen to music. Listen to music at home when you're recovering. Put your legs up, turn on the symphony, whatever it is you're into, and then relax and you can truly put your attention on the music. Multitasking is overrated. You're missing out. You're gonna cycle, cycle. Get involved with the environment. I don't put anything in my ears. 
it's a group ride i gotta hear what these guys are doing the other riders i gotta pay attention to the sensations of my legs and all that's too much too much going on for my brain to decipher and then be distracted with music or whatever else I carry my phone on these rides, but it's muted and it's in a bag. <laughs> it is stored for my use, not to receive calls. You can see it's 2%, we're doing 23 miles an hour, steadily. So that's, if you're gonna ride with a group that does this, your training should train you for holding sustained efforts in the zone, not the speed necessarily, because the conditions will be different. Meaning, like right now I'm at the bottom of zone four. So when I train, if I'm gonna ride like this a lot, I need to spend a lot of time in zone four, you know, and, and get acclimated to it. Because if you don't, then as soon as you see you're getting in zone four, your breathing start getting a little choppy, panic. No, it's okay to breathe hard, breathe deeply. I don't even see my heart rate when I'm riding, and that's on purpose. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't care to know what it's doing. I analyze it later. So we're at uh, 8.30, Highway 8.30. We're going to wait after the highway because we've lost a bunch of people. Here, my brother. I don't think Paul gives me the camera here. So I don't know what you did this weekend, but this is part of what we did. On Saturday, 